sense of pleasure that I ask John G. L. Cabot at our head table and our president, Dan Schrager, to come forth to the podium and present the 2012 Godfrey L. Cabot Award to Herbert D. Keller. Bob pointed out many years ago 
Uh, the airline industry has a net loss since its inception, and it still does. And I'll be honest with you, if you're from our industry, you don't get invited out very much. <laughs> so that's another reason I'm damn glad to be. <laughs> and uh, I'm uh, terribly sorry that Colleen Barrett, uh, my business partner at Southwest Airlines for many years, could not make it. Had a little uh, thunderstorm and with a lot of lightning in Dallas. And evidently, her home is uh, uh, more than usually vulnerable to lightning strikes. So no doors, gates, anything would open. Nothing would play, including her radio, and so she had to bow, bow out of this trip. But she is a native New Englander from Bellows Falls, Vermont. I'm sure that all of you have spent many years in Bellows Falls. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, she was truly distressed uh, that she couldn't, uh, couldn't be with you. Uh, particularly, uh, I must say, when she found out that Jan and Bob were going to be here. And uh, I must confess to you uh, that I stand before you is somewhat of a, uh, I guess it would be appropriate to say a fraud, uh, a charlatan, and a totally, total Monty Bank, uh, because it's really uh, the people of Southwest Airlines uh, who have won this award. I'm simply a surrogate standing in uh, on their behalf. I used to joke with them. I said, they thought I was joking. I said, you know, paragraph six of my employment agreement says, you do all the work, and I take all the credit. <laughs> and basically, that's what happened for the last 40 years. And there's some of those Southwest people here, and I would ask them to stand so that I can pay tribute to them along with the rest of you. Uh -huh. Thanks for getting me up here, gang. saga of uh, Southwest Airlines, uh, briefly, uh, even if not coherently, and uh, we started out as an intrastate carrier, licensed solely by the state of Texas, uh, because the CAV uh, basically didn't favor uh, competition uh, very much, and hadn't authorized a new trunk airline since it was formed in 1938, and so intrastate was basically the only opportunity that you had to get started as an airline. And Roy Pulsifer, uh, one of the staff members at the CAB, and surely one of the greatest staff members ever, uh, wrote a report that said basically the CAB through 40 years has uh, suppressed competition and increased fares throughout the United States of America. Now, if you're on the staff, that takes a little guts to write that about the board that you're working for. And uh, certainly that appeared to be the case uh, because uh, when I started working on Southwest Airlines, only about 15% of adults in the United States had ever flown on a single commercial airline flight. And uh, one of the big barriers to flying was cost. And we changed that. And today, about 85% of adults in America have flown on a commercial airline flight. But as I was saying to Mr. Cabot, you know, it also struck me in kind of a, you know, my own level way that 85% of America who had never flown constituted a pretty good market opportunity. Now we uh, were not welcomed warmly uh, by the incumbent carriers at that time in the industry, uh, Brandon Continental, the old Continental, and Trans Texas took out after us, uh, which required four and a half years of litigation, including a trip to the United States Supreme Court, two trips to the Texas Supreme Court, uh, before we could commence uh, operations. And as a matter of fact, you may have heard the old saying uh, that it's better to know the judge than it is to know the law. We ran into that because the trial judge actually went through the United States Supreme Court and Texas Supreme Court and joined us in commencing operations two days before we were to start. So I had to hustle down to Austin, get the Supreme Court to issue a written mandate as banning that trial judge from enforcing his injunction, uh, which kind of got us underway. And uh, it got to the point where uh, it was almost like I'd walk into the Supreme Court of Texas and the Chief Justice would say, okay, Herbie, what is it today? <laughs> <laughs> we were there a lot. And uh, uh, we, uh, 
we uh, also uh, had a very difficult time uh, because those three parents I just mentioned were obviously opposing us to run us out of the money, and they did. And we lost our financing in 69, and we didn't have any money. Now, for the lawyers in the audience, this may get me barred from the guild of lawyers, but I agreed to work for nothing and to pay all the court costs out of my own pocket to keep the company going. And the board of directors was very agreeable to that. <laughs> they had no trouble uh, saying, uh, okay. And then uh, we decided to stay at Love Field, and uh, everybody wanted us to leave Love Field except us. And that went to the United States Supreme Court twice. But I was a little hard when I filed my brief in opposition to certiorari at the United States Supreme Court. And the assistant clerk looked down and he looked at the caption on my brief and he said, are they picking on your little Texas airline again? <laughs> I was very heartened about the outcome of that proceeding uh, when he said that. Uh, there was also uh, a lot of uh, uh, work going on behind the scenes. Uh, we had a, I shouldn't say this uh, with the regional director here, but we had a little firefight uh, with Braniff down at Houston Pompey Airport. We reopened it to commercial air service, and uh, Braniff brought in an unfanned 707, which sounded like a thousand Irish banshees with hernias. <laughs> Uh, and I can't imagine how loud they were, how much they screamed. Uh, they hung a, a, a banner at the end of the concourse uh, talking about them being there and how good they were. And our station manager went up to cut it down and uh, got into a fight with Brandon's station manager. And uh, let's see, they used to uh, pose our airplanes up with little trash into ours. It was ramp boarding. But we got them good one day because uh, they didn't have enough room uh, to push their 707 down and they asked us to move our airplane. We said, no, we won't. You have to power back and they blew out two engines. <laughs> that was a day of great triumph. Now, the F then the FAA stepped in. <laughs> then the FAA stepped in to spoil sports. <laughs> I said, you guys better quit this stuff. But uh, I got a great call during those early years uh, from my sister-in-law who had flown Southwest Airlines from Houston to San Antonio. And she called me and she said, Herb, I want to tell you, I think your airline is going to be a tremendous success. And I said, Nancy, why do you say that? She said, well, it's the best in-flight service I've ever experienced flying over here on Thanksgiving. And I said, well, how many people were on the airplane? She said, just me. <laughs> So, with three flight attendants to one passenger, <laughs> pretty easy to uh, pretty easy to shine uh, when that's going on. Um, we had to sell our we had to sell our fourth airplane to meet payroll, and uh, we kept flying the four airplanes together with the three airplanes, which is what led to the ten minute turn at the jetway. Go ahead and stop. Passengers off, baggage on. Passengers on, baggage on. Push back in ten minutes, and Bob Crandall may not remember this, but years ago, I called Bob flying southwest to Tulsa. Now, since that was uh, heavily populated by American, uh, had about 7,000 maintenance employees there, and a regular schedule, I said, aha, I believe he's doing a little espionage. So Bob called me, and he said, I've been doing a little espionage, and he said, I want to tell you one thing, Bert. Don't ever change how you do ground operations. <laughs> do you remember that? <laughs> And we, we didn't, and we haven't. But uh, uh, even though we didn't have any profits, uh, we did set up the first profit share plan in the American Airlines industry in 1973. Now, of course, you know, if you don't have any profits, it's easy to set up a profit share plan. <laughs> <laughs> but we did make a little profit that year. And later on, our employees uh, benefited enormously as their average uh, compensation increased by 10 or 15 percent through profit sharing contributions uh, with no contribution on their part, uh, by the way. And uh, by 1974, uh, we were serving every significant city in Texas on an intrastate basis. And we kind of run out of gas uh, because 
It left Steinbox to support air service. Uh, we didn't have any place to go. And uh, we uh, had increased the size of uh, the markets we served by two or three hundred percent within a very short period of time. And Houston, Dallas, for instance, went from 34th largest in the United States to fifth largest in the United States in terms of numbers of passengers within one year of a survey. But uh, then, you know, we had to find something else to do. And uh, deregulation uh, popped into our minds. One of Bob's favorite subjects, deregulation. <laughs> I'm almost afraid to say the word in front of him. <laughs> I might be eviscerated. But uh, in any event, we have been uh, lobbying for it for some time. And there are a great many uh, economists who were saying, why was this industry ever regulated? It's a naturally competitive industry. It should not be regulated, you know, from the economist standpoint. And uh, as I say, we have been we have been lobbying, but this is where New England came to the fore. And I don't know man, how many people in this audience know this, uh, really. But we got a call from Senator Ted Kennedy one day. And basically Senator Kennedy said, why does it cost, cost twice as much to fly from Boston, New York, as it does from Dallas to Houston? And we said, well, Senator, basically because we're not regulated by the federal government. That means we can be efficient, productive, and charge whatever fares we want to, which is a little different from the federal regime. Well, Senator Kennedy held hearings on deregulation of the airline industry, which peeved the chairman of the Senate Commerce Committee just a little because he had committee jurisdiction over that issue. But uh, he and Senator Kennedy finally patched it up and he held the, uh, the seminal hearings on deregulation of the industry, which Southwest Airlines was used as an exemplar probably 15 uh, times uh, in the report. And so uh, we went on to become a national uh, carrier uh, freed from the boundaries of the state of Texas. And I think you'll be amused uh, to hear that a Texas congressman wrote me and said, Herb, if you take Southwest Airlines interstate, you're going to destroy it. And I wrote back and said, Congressman, I beg to remind you that man, not God, ordained the boundaries of the state of Texas. <laughs> and I loved his response, which was, Herb, are you sure? <laughs> <laughs> I did have to laugh. <laughs> but uh, I'll never forget the uh, conference, the press conference at uh, BWI Baltimore, where we, we were announcing we were coming in. And uh, a reporter from there, from Washington, says, Well, Mr. Kelleher, he says, uh, I want to ask you this question. You've done very well out west. <laughs> but he said, What makes you think you'll be successful in the most competitive part of the United States, the east? And I said, well, let me tell you how competitive the East is. Uh, U.S. Airs, one way fare, walk up to Cleveland, is $349. When we start flying, it's going to be $29. <laughs> now, that's what we call competition. <laughs> and uh, he kind of subsided when I told him that. And then we had a Friends Fly Free program that Bob also loved. He told me many, many times. <laughs> I, I, I've still got scars on my butt. <laughs> so, so they discovered that two could go for the price of one. And U.S. Air put in a $24.50 walk up there. So we just put in a $19 fare. <laughs> so the first flight went out. Instead of paying $349, you paid $19. And I had to call a young man uh, in Baltimore and counseled him from the standpoint of an older, wiser head. Because he was interviewed by the Baltimore Sun, and they, they said, why did you take uh, your girlfriend to Cleveland to the Rock and Roll Museum on her birthday? And he said, well, it's the cheapest thing I could do. <laughs> and the counselor I was going to give it's okay if it's cheap, but don't announce it, especially where your girlfriend can read it. <laughs> But uh, the day your mom all this was that, uh, you know, Warren Buffett, in a comment I love, said somebody should have shot down Orville Wright and Kitty Hawk in 1903. It would have been a great boom to capitalism had that been the case. And when asked about his own investment in U.S. Air, 
He said, I plead temporary insanity. But uh, he missed one airline uh, with those comments because Money Magazine uh, in 2002 uh, ran an article that said, Ripley's, believe it or not, of all the companies in the uh, S&P 500 for the last 30 years, Southwest Airlines, an airline, has produced the highest return to investors. If you invested $100,000 in Southwest Airlines in 72, in 2002 it would have been worth $100 million. Uh, and uh, as I said, we've never had a, uh, we never had a furlough been profitable for uh, uh, 40 consecutive uh, years and really uh, emulated worldwide on all the continents by other carriers except Dan Arnold. And you know the reason for that. Penguins can't fly. <laughs> so that's why we're not there. But we do have imitators in Europe, Australia, Asia, and around the globe. And uh, I want to tell you something else that's very important to me. Uh, I read an essay once. It was a little girl's essay. And it was about Socrates. And this was her entire essay. This is what she wrote. Socrates was a philosopher. He talked a lot. They poisoned him. <laughs> so with that, I'll say thank you very much. <laughs>